Namaste everyone. The, the acronym PMSC should be very much in vogue in Nepal, given that it means it refers to private military and security companies. Uh, in a way, uh, the fact that the discourse here in Kathmandu does not deal enough from a social scientific level and even from a media analysis level with such companies indicates that there is a need for us to uh, get engaged with this topic and which starts with recognizing a certain acronym and uh, we have uh, Dr. Amanda Chisholm here um, to introduce to us uh, to introduce us to this acronym and all that it means for us in Nepal in terms of everything from our economy to uh, the emotional uh, weight on communities and families. Um, something that has been an evolution perhaps in a way from the uh, system of <coughs> Gorkha recruitment onward to in the modern era of um, these PMSCs where Nepalese now are found in large parts of the globe if I'm correct and of course Dr. Chisholm will eliminate us to the extent to which Nepalese are engaged in this terrain. Uh, this particular, uh, just uh, quickly uh, Amanda Chisholm's uh, background is already given in the handout, but let me just say that uh, she's a political ethnographer, a senior lecturer at the Gender and Security, on Gender and Security in the School of Secu uh, Security Studies in King's College. And uh, she has written on the Gorkhas in the past, among much else that she's done. The last three years she has been involved in uh, what would be called the political ethnography, studying of uh, doing field work in Afghanistan, Nepal, Qatar, and the United Kingdom. And she's here today uh, actually as part of what she called a roadshow for her nearly complete manuscript, which she is coming around, which I thought was a very, uh, very fine and transparent way of moving ahead towards final publication which is to share with relevant entities uh, here in Nepal uh, a, 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 an entity that actually we know very little about. We know a lot about the UN system willingly, but not the IOM, but you've also presented to the IOM. And um, beyond that also, we are privileged uh, that uh, if you call this an academic or a civil society group, that she uh, has found it opportune and possible to come and make a presentation to us. Um, I personally think that having spoken to her briefly and having also read about her work, there will be much more of interest to us um, historically in terms of uh, timeline, going back to history and looking ahead to the future. What do these private security companies mean for us from the ethical to the economic? The entire spectrum, I think, is carried in, the, in this topic. But for the little, even the little that I know, for example, I know that Blackwater is a private and military security <coughs> company. Amanda just tells me that so is Group 4. Group 4 we here in Nepal consider as a, consider a benign a security company, but I was just informed that if they also do private military duties, uh, I would personally also be interested, and I would make a special request by way of closing, Amanda, that what is the what as far as you can tell, what is the reach of and the number of Nepalis in these companies? Could it be that their value to the Nepali economy or their impact to everything from our morality to our economy? Uh, is little known or understood here in Kathmandu. We await your elimination. Thank you. Okay. Gosh, thanks for such a welcoming introduction. 
Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that question, but I just I really uh, appreciate any sort of comments and feedback that, that you guys may have. Um, I'll spend, I think, the, the next hopefully 45 minutes um, really just talking about uh, the, the security industry, my own research within it, and um, some uh, themes that have arisen from the last 10 years of my research on private voluntary security companies, in addition to this uh, um, more recent work that I just completed. So, um, you know, just by way of introduction, I come into the exploring the security industry from a political sociological examination of the men and women who participate as security contractors and broader supportive roles. And so this isn't just uh, Nepali people, but this is also um, elite forces from the United Kingdom and their families and the roles that they play in, in supporting the, the broader industry. And I bring them into conversation with, with one another. So this talk, again, is based on um, 10 years of research ethnographic work of private military and security company labor chains that do operations in armed and unarmed security. Um, and then this is, this is based on two years of ethnographic research in Afghanistan, as well as six months in Qatar, um, six months in Nepal, and then um, just, you know, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago in the UK. <laughs> so, um, right, okay, so we move on. Okay, so private military and security companies really actually predate the nation state or how we understand the modern state today. Um, when they go far back as uh, Macabre was actually writing about them as well, mercenaries. Um, they, uh, their operations trouble the nation state in a variety of ways and trouble how international relations and security studies um, people come to think about them and their role and what they mean um, to the state. We were have, I was having a brief conversation, I can't remember who with in the audience um, was mentioning that you know a defining feature of the nation state is being the sole purveyor of legitimate violence. Uh, whether that's you know in um, prisons or just overseas through military or police forces, and uh, security companies um, challenge that notion. So, uh, if we think about more contemporary um, security companies that have sat alongside the nation state, um, the their contentious histories really arose, or my interest was tweaked in them, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, executive outcomes in Sandline International operations in Africa, particularly in Sierra Leone and Angola, and the ways in which they forged relationships with these countries, um, uh, that they would provide security services in outright conflicts, on um, behalf of these governments uh, in reciprocity of having um, a portion of their diamond and um, oil and gold reserves. And uh, if we talked about just military effectiveness in creating peace by peace, I mean the absence of war, uh, the, these companies were actually very effective. Um, and they were touted as, or they touted themselves as being more effective than the United Nations in, in ending war in these two countries. Uh, but a whole host of normative um, problems uh, arose uh, from their operations um, in terms of transparency, accountability, and broader legitimation of are these actually legitimate actors. And so for the longest time, these companies continued to be at the periphery of broader security. We still saw the legitimate security providers as the ones within state militaries and state police forces. And it wasn't really until um, the Iraq, the first Iraq war, where you saw um, private military and security companies actually operating side by side um, uh, and under US UK contracts in particular. And what I like to test my students on, I do a pub quiz with them, a pub tech style quiz when, when I lecture on private security, is that um, most people are quite shocked, but out of all the Western military or Western militaries, it's actually the United Kingdom is the most privatized um, military out of all the Western countries. And the privatization of 
their military happened in a very innocuous way. It happened through water and sanitation. So they outsourced that to private companies. And now they have Kellogg Brown and Root, for example, that sits side by side with um, military, British military logistics officers in thinking about how they plan to wage war and how they plan their different um, global military operations. So much so that um, Albert, Albert Hampson and Williams have now really thought of contemporary private security or contemporary global security through what they call is security <coughs> assemblages. And what they mean by that is that we can't understand global security operations without understanding the ways in which private and public are assembled. So there's no need to buy it anymore where this is the market and this is the state, but they're very much integrated. That private military and security companies are central now to how Western states reach war. They can't do it without them. But of course, <clears throat> for a lot of scholars then who study the security industry, there's huge issues around transparency and accountability. And I think there was a presenter here, I don't know when, on the, the book, um, The Girl from Kathmandu. Did, did they come and present on that? I think that book really highlights how difficult it is to hold these um, companies accountable if there's any sort of human rights violations. And same with the Blackwater um, uh, massacre. Uh, it took over 10 years to hold the security contractors accountable through US courts, and they still ended up not being fully accountable. And then the, you know, the, the, the leader, Air Prince, was never held accountable. Just dissolved the company and opened up a new one, dissolved that one and opened up a new one. Um, so there, there's huge issues around, um, around the accountability, accountability mechanisms that I don't think international law has quite got their head around um, yet. So, um, let me just, uh, I think where I've come into these debates is I look at um, the security industry again through the lens of labor and the men and women, mostly men, who work in the security industry. And look at it, the, the, the security industry, um, private industry is booming because it enables a flexible global workforce where men and women can easily upscale for different military security operations and then downscale again, right? So this is the broader flexibilization of labor itself. Um, moving away from stable, professional, you know, lifelong careers and more of a, a flexible work model. And interesting, it happened within the United States with um, the end of military conscription. And with that, it was the end of, um, it was the freeing up of the market and freeing up of the labor to, to, um, to work in, in global security. So, yeah, so my curiosity about the in industry is really one of, of labor. But also a feminist one. So I'm just going to briefly tell you why we should be concerned with feminism and what feminist theory about the industry, um, what it illuminates that we don't already know. So again, whilst the you know, majority of the scholarship within the security um, studies background and political economy has focused on accountability and really questions of how we can make the industry better, um, most feminist research completely rejects that. They actually don't think that private security should be a part of you know, our, our global operations. Um, they don't think there's anything normal or natural about that. They highlight the clear uh, gender divisions of labor within the industry, how men perform security work and women continue to take on supportive roles. Um, you know, and they also talk about how there's an actual remasculizing of security, and what they mean by that is, particularly in Western countries where you have militaries having to force open up for women combat roles and more frontline roles. At the same time, you have a closing down in the security industry. Don't have those same demands, right? So where you have women serving in in combat arms. Um, roles throughout a variety of different countries that's not reflected within uh, the private security industry. It's still predominantly, particularly in, in conflict or hostile environments, it's predominantly a male's job. Um, and the broader lack of accountability, uh, how that specifically impacts women and those other politically marginalized from seeking justice when human rights abuses occur. So these are some very, um, I think, important claims that feminists have brought um, about the security industry. For my 
myself, I use feminism as um, a theoretical framework, but also a methodology, in particular, Cynthia Enloe's concept of the feminist curiosity. And so what I mean by that, as a method, that enables me to not only locate where the women are, so look at the global security industry and specifically locate where do we find the women, but also men at the margins. And this allows me to explore how you know, global uh, security structures um, uh, draw boundaries around who are acceptable um, security contractors, uh, who are rendered visible, who do the invisible work, um, and how these boundaries are political. There's nothing natural or normal about them. Uh, so a feminist curiosity does not assume that gender, race, caste, sexuality um, is something that we know ahead of time, but rather it sees gender, it sees these ideas as a question, right? And it looks to the field and how these ideas um, manifest themselves differently depending on the context and histories in which they have come to make meaning. So for example, um, you know, if, if you look at GERPAs and private military and security companies, uh, gender alongside race becomes more meaningful when we think about um, the ways in which they're valued, how they come into the industry, and how they experience the industry. I'll talk about that more later, though. So the, I think that the biggest, um, for me, the biggest theoretical importance that feminism brings is it's a denaturalizing of practices of race and gender. It's not just assuming because women aren't a part of the security industry means that it's somehow natural that they're not a part of it, but it sees this as it is a political choice and a political decision. Divisions of labor, how we value security differently depending on who's doing it, is a political choice, not a natural one. Is that making sense? Just getting feedback. Is everyone kind of with me? The, again, the, the, the broader questions that really frame my um, occupation or preoccupation with the industry is how does global private security industry shape global workforces, but also shaped by these global workforces? What kinds of work are actually being done, and how are divisions of labor being established and normalized or naturalized? And how is value being assigned? What do we recognize as valuable and important? and what do we um, render invisible, banal, or not important. Again, this research is based upon um, my field work with Gurkhas in Afghanistan, <coughs> but it's also based on a two-year um, Economic and Social Research Council funding fund <coughs> that explored Nepali unarmed security labor chains um, and their households going from Nepal into Qatar. So I'm exploring two different chains, unarmed and armed chains. Unarmed security or just unarmed workers? Um, unarmed security, yeah, yeah. So I adopted a track the migrant methodology, which means I followed um, the same sort of geographies and networks that migrants um, will take from Nepal into whether it's Afghanistan or if it's into Qatar, including the families themselves, and that enabled me to render more visible the informal and formal networks and pathways and the different stakeholders that they have to um, go through to seek foreign employment. Um, within, the two year, within the study of the unarmed um, security migrants, I spent five months in Qatar, hanging out with security migrants and, um, and the country managers uh, and facility managers. And then I spent five months of field work in Nepal, uh, hanging out with families, often sometimes with the families of the migrants um, that I met in Qatar recruitment company, owners, managers, and some of the Pali government representatives. The project's main intellectual objectives were to systematically map out recruitment pro um, patterns into unarmed and armed security, and to explore what work, again, is actually being done, how it gets valued or devalued, and what are the divisions of labor that are being produced. And like I said, I draw heavily upon the intellectual work of feminist political economists and feminist affect theories, or theorists rather, that I can go into further um, detail later on, but also um, in question and answer. Uh, the key concepts for me in exploring this, um, this industry is the concept of the everyday, 
that means obviously a geographic location, but it also means a concept of how we think about the ways in which our everyday lives are shaped, but also shaping global economies and global security. So not to treat them as separate, distinct entities, but to see them as uh, mutually constitutive and engaged with one another. Um, also, the role of emotional labor uh, is really important for me to, to uh, uh, you know, the more I've researched on this, the more I realize that the security industry does very much rest upon emotional labor in making people feel safe and feel secure. So a lot of this is this intangible labor that security contractors will do to make their clients or customers feel safe. So, so accounting for the emotional labor. Um, but not every contractor does the same emotional labor. Um, and not every contractor is valued for the same sort of work they do. So, so um, emotional labor is important to me. And the broader um, feminization and racialization of labor. And what that means, what, what feminists, but also critical political economists have looked at, is the ways in which labor gets devalued through um, appeal to flexible working uh, or a workforce, but this gets devalued, particularly when it becomes naturalized, when, when people are just naturally good at something or seen as naturally good at something, it means that we don't have to invest in them and invest in their skill sets the same way we would if, uh, if someone, um, their skill is seen through accreditation or experience. Um, and this becomes really important when we think about um, Gurkha's martial race history and the naturalizing of their, their, their military skill set as opposed to white Westerners who are always seen as professional through years of military experience. And of course, Gurkhas have years of military experience too, but that gets overwritten with, the, with this broader martial race um, narrative. This might be a point you want to get back to later. Yeah, yeah, I can pick that up in questions too. Right. Okay, so why Nepal? So Nepal um, remains a very desirable country of recruitment for um, security companies within the unarmed and armed security. In part, a large part is because of the legacies of Gurkhas um, that Nepal holds. So, um, you know, Gurkhas, this, this, um, uh, the, the identity of Gurkhas really constructed through a colonial imagining of who these men were written largely by um, British military officers um, who wrote about the bravery and fierceness of these men, um, that their value was rooted in their biology. Uh, they're just, um, they were martial race. They're understood through martial race logic that by something in their blood, um, you know, and the, and the hills in which they come from made them strong, brave, and really amenable to military service. And so, of course, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone here knows who Gurkhas are. I didn't until I went to Afghanistan, so I was amazed by it. Yes, yeah. But it's, um, you know, uh, so we all know that Gurkhas have this global reputation and global reach. And so this makes them desirable initially into the industry, um, particularly in, you know, in the, in the armed security in Afghanistan. Um, they, um, they were revered and loved by a variety of um, security, con or security companies. And they were, um, this was because of their you know, 200 years of um, association with the British military. And so they felt a lot of these um, security companies are owned or managed by British or US uh, um, people, and they felt that they could know and trust these men. So while that provided them um, a unique access to the global security industry and compared to other countries uh, in the global south, it also really limited um, their ability to, uh, to move within the industry, to move up into more management positions, kind of pigeonhole them into this um, because you know, the, 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 the value came from their biology and they were born with this. Um, they really need it, continue to need uh, the assistance, leadership, and mentorship from white security contractors. And this was what I wrote about in selling the Gurkha security package. This is what made them really valuable in the industry, is the continual association with their white managers. So much so, um, you know, the, the Gurkha legacy also um, permeates the unarmed industry, which actually baffles a lot of recruitment um, companies in the call that I talked to. 
So uh, this is initially what brings um, um, security companies to Nepal because this desire for one purpose. Um, even though the security work um, that is done in Qatar has nothing, you, you don't need a military background to do that sort of work. It's mostly working in shopping centers and education facilities, you're doing access controls, so you're checking IDs. A lot of it is more customer service. Um, so the ability to speak English, the ability to be friendly, those, those are more attributes. But um, for some reason, these companies still come to Nepal first and foremost um, because of this group of legacy. So it's, it's really important um, you know, for, for why these global companies are, are, are coming to Nepal. I'm just checking the time. Right. So one of the key findings I did find um, with uh, uh, with these security migrants is again there's there's um, there's a racial and gender hierarchy of workforces, and this is in part because the the global security industry continues to be founded on a culture of whiteness, and what this means is it's based upon the white Western men are seen as the archetype, the ideal security contractor. And all other men and women are always measured against it. So their value is measured in how close they can come to mimicking or being like a white Westerner. So this matters in that, um, you know, in everyday kind of working life, security life, white Western contractors are just assumed to know what they're doing. Um, and they're assumed to be professionals, where a lot of the times, um, Gurkhas, Nepalis, but other um, you know, global south men and women have to prove their worth. So this is an everyday exhausting um, endeavor for, for a lot of these people to, to prove that, that they're valuable security providers. What also happens is clients in particular of these um, you know, recipients of this security service tend to value uh, Gurkhas and Nepalis differently um, in that um, these men are generally valued for the emotional work that they do. Uh, so you're talking to different clients in Afghanistan but also Qatar and they value these men for um, you know, the asking them you know, if they want a cup of tea, asking them how their day is, being that more of that, that friendly kind of um, voice to them where white, white Westerners are valued for their um, security intelligence, their security briefings that they give them, um, the, the standard operating procedures. Uh, so, you know, no client would ever ask a, a security contractor to bring them a cup of tea, but they'll ask, say, a Gurkha to bring them a, bring them a cup of tea. And so what I think is important about this is this highlights that these men do different work and they're valued for different work. So. While you know these contracts might um, you know say particularly you know your job is access control, your job is um, VIP protection or whatnot, uh, these contracts don't write in that sort of emotional work that's accepted or that's expected of them, um, and that so this isn't actually formally recognized in any contracts or anything, and it's, it's it has led to uh, an everyday kind of wearing out or draining of a lot of these contractors. I think too it's also important to um, account for the household uh, in all of this and not treat the household as something separate of the industry but very much central to how the industry functions. So in part um, it, it's easier for security companies to rec recruit from Nepal because the families are already established and for this sort of labor, that they already have the community and familiar networks um, and divisions of labor that enable this sort of migration process to, to happen in the first place. So it's, it's kind of an easy sell um, to, to recruit them and to you know, recruit them for a year or two years before they return home to their families. Beyond that, uh, the, the work that the households actually do, they do a lot of emotional work in keeping migrants working over in Qatar or Afghanistan. This is particularly when um, you know, uh, these, these men might have a very difficult day, they'll call home, they'll say, I've had it, I'm really frustrated, 
Um, and it'll be the families that remind them why they're doing this work and the families that kind of keep them resilient, resilient workforce through the emotional labor and mentoring and support that they do. The families are also key to different financial investments, particularly case of Gurkha wives, um, belonging to a variety of cooperative schemes um, in you know, taking the lead of investing in land or investing in a variety of different schemes that, um, um, that leads to more of a, a sustainable future for them, financial future. Obviously, doing all the care work for the aging in-laws, parents, and young children, and often farming and subsistence work as well. So they, these are you know, the work that, that the households do. And I think when we bring the household in, um, that this was a little bit of a contentious argument with the ILO, but I'm going to say this anyway, is that um, a prime reason for this sort of recruitment, talking to families and security um, contractors, is that there is a, a, a crisis of social reproduction, a crisis of reproduction within the home. And what I mean by that is that, um, particularly with unarmed security families, migrant families, is that um, there is this profound inability to um, materially reproduce itself, to get the medicine they need for their families if they have sick families, to, to even um, provide food, to provide education, different sort of um, aspirations to own their own land, own their own home, and it's these desires, and it's this, uh, this, this crisis um, within the household that is this primary motivation for why these men seek work in the security industry. But what I also found interesting, and when you look at the unarmed security industry, the amount of debt that a lot of these uh, families and migrants have to, have to take in paying for different recruitment fees, um, etc., leads to a cycle of poverty as well. It, it, it keeps them in debt, right? Um, so, so it's not necessarily that this migration pattern actually uplifts people from debt it just, um, or poverty. It, 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 it continues a cycle of poverty. This, of course, is not as acute in, in Gurkha um, um, migration. This is more um, featured in the unarmed um, security labor chains. Also, I think um, the, the movement of men, particularly into this industry, because in Nepal it, it is only men who go, at least legally, into the unarmed and armed security industry, um, means that you have um, a body, a, you know, a living, breathing body leaving the family, but you still have these everyday household chores um, and, and, and support that needs to be done, but with less hands. Um, and we have um, uh, political economists like Shannon Ray who talk about this uh, globally in terms of this concept of depletion. And what it means is that you just have um, the same volume of work, less people being able to do that work, and then it leads into a depleting of an um, individual, whether it's your physical health, emotional health, but also a depletion of communities um, and, and a community um, mobilizing. I just want to make the caveat now is this, when, when I make all these statements, I'm not saying that there is something natural or normal about women doing this work, and I'm not saying that we should just not have women migrating. This is not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is we just need to make visible this type of labor that's being done um, and, and, and to account for this type of gender work that is so fundamental um, to, to, the, to the migration industry itself but potentially alert ourselves to the different harm that this can do. Um, the final note I want to talk about when we talk about the household is increasingly, particularly talking to younger wives, they express the need um, or needing to restrict their own movements around the community and they were very acute about um, uh, knowing or, or who they were being seen with um, because of this gossip that permeates these communities um, that could potentially lead to marriage breakdowns, domestic violence, and street harassment. Uh, and this was an emerging issue that I think is important as we move to create more mobility for migrant workers. I think we need to also look at what sort of mobility um, is happening in the household that, that stayed, the, the people that stay behind. 
Yeah, okay, so then invisible labor. So I think the, the role of emotion and affect, um, the, the emotional labor and affective labor, again, isn't just happening in the household. I think full stop when we look at the security industry from the uh, white Western contractors down to you know, the, 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 the wives and, and, um, and um, mothers and sons in the home, everyone does some sort of emotional or affective work. So the security industry definitely rests upon this sort of labor. Um, and so what I mean by this is, in particular, I'm f informed by feminists from the 1970s that have written about the often unpaid and silenced care and emotional work that mostly women have done at home in the reproductive space, um, but also in the productive workspace. And so when we talk about the workspace, we're talking about the ways in which it's often um, women who are called upon to manage emotions of other people, um, to not be quick to anger, to make sure if someone else is getting angry that they talk them down. Certainly my own experience in higher education in the UK, there's lots of um, um, reporting around students and, and professors alike expect um, women to, to manage um, emotions or do pastoral care, doing all this care work in the public space much more than men. And why this becomes important, as them to say, is that whilst we might be doing the same job, there's this double burden that's often put on women to do this silenced um, care work. Um, so, um, and then Arlie Horschild, her book called The Managed Heart, talks about this um, unacknowledged emotional work, the way it actually becomes acknowledged through, she studied airline hostess in, in, um, um, in the United States and the way in which airlines themselves commodify this emotional work to make passengers feel safe, feel important. Um, they really fostered this sort of emotional work of, of, their, um, of the airline um, um, stewardess. And, uh, and, and the implications that have for the airline stewardess too. Why does this matter for the security industry? Well, for me, what it again highlights is that um, Gurkha's Nepali workforce, but also global, work, um, global South workforces within the industry are, are asked or really demanded to do this caring empathy work um, what I call the dirty work of the security industry, right? They're, they're kind of the, um, the waste disposal uh, in a lot of cases, in, in that they're the ones that if there's any sort of frustrations on the client's part, um, they're more um, amenable to our, um, receiving verbal abuse, um, you know, sometimes the total lashing out, and then it was the expectation that they don't say anything, that they stuff these emotions down, that they just return that, um, re return the abuse with a smile, right? And they're told to, you know, that, that their role is to diffuse the situation by absorbing um, the anger and hostility at times from other people. And actually, when I looked, you know, talked to security migrants in Qatar, this was the single most difficult thing that they had to endure. Um, when when um, contractor Samir told me the reason he left the security industry, unarmed security industry, is um, he got news from his family of the death of his grandfather, and uh, he told his um, country manager about that, and his country manager said he can't go home, and he told him you still need to go to work. And he said this was really difficult for him because He's had to absorb this news, and then he still had to go to work, maintain a smile, um, still often, you know, be um, confronted by clients, and then still stuff the emotions down. There was just so much stuffing of emotions where he just felt that it, it wasn't worth it um, for him to continue on with that work. I think also what became profound for me when, when, when you look at the emotional stuffing that is done um, I, I'll, I'll just briefly tell you another story about Sunika and Rabindra, our uh, Gurkha um, husband and wife uh, in eastern Nepal, and they were married for 20 years. And I was sitting having an interview with them while they were preparing for their daughter's wedding. Um, and so there was people hustling about, setting up, and there was a lot of joy in the air. 
and I asked them if they could tell me about their early years of marriage. And at that moment, there was a bit of tension that filled the room. And Sanika um, recalled the point where she said, well, actually, um, I forced Rabindra to become a Gurkha. And so for me, I'm like, this is the first time I heard about someone being forced to become a Gurkha. I always thought people, you know, were lining up. And uh, they, were, they were a young couple with um, two children, and they were coming from a very poor farming background, and she um, never got to go to school, and she aspired for her children to be educated. And so she um, strongly encouraged Ravindra, guilted him into, into um, applying for the Indian Army. And he became a Gurkha with the Indian Army, and uh, he divulged to me how he hated it. He um, hated being physically absent from his children growing up. And uh, Sunika told me the first letter he sent home, because back then there was no mobile phone, Skype, or anything. It was communication through letters. The first letter she received from him was one expressing he actually hated this job. He just wanted to come home. He didn't want to be a Gurkha. He missed the family. And I asked her what she did. And she said that she um, just um, folded the letter up and. And, and stuff those emotions down. And I asked her, I'm like, well, did you talk to about, anyone about it? Did you have any support? And she said, no, because if she talked to anyone, they just assumed you're a Gurkha wife, you're crazy for having any sort of regrets or guilt. So she, um, you know, she had an intense amount of guilt that she just continued to stuff down. Mm -hmm. Rabindra had an intense amount of regrets for being absent from uh, you know, from his family um, while he was doing military service. And what I found really interesting is that they're recalling this, um, you know, 20 years or 15 years later, and those still those emotions raise, right? So they still hold on to those feelings. And this is amid, again, the celebration and excitement of the ability that, you know, their kids were educated and their daughter is getting married and this, this future of you know the the positive future of their children, but of course you know this uh, intense amount of emotional um, labor that they continue to hold on to, and this is part and parcel also of what it means to do military and security service as well. Um, that I'm I'm still coming to grips with of what what this actually means, but I think what it makes visible is that it makes them visible this sort of emotional and affective work that, that um, features within, within the security industry. So for me, and then after talking again with IL, um, ILO and ILM and this broader you know, questions around how we you know, think about ethics in broader global recruitment and fair labor, um, I think focusing on the everyday and focusing on the ways in which the security industry um, can, can wear down people and wear out people um, and, and the, this invisible labor that is a necessary, most unacknowledged part of the industry is I think this tells us something different about ethics and what, what we mean when we talk about ethics in global labor. And so, of course, you know, um, an important part of the story is, again, these egregious and criminal violations that include passport confiscation, paying for visas and tickets, debt bondage, human trafficking, all of that still needs to be part of, you know, our, our talk around ethics of fair labor. But for me, I think we also need to recognize everyday work life um, and, um, and, and the ways in which, um, gender and race inform different types of work that people do. So even though we have contractually the same sort of work, they're expected um, you know, to, to do different, um, it's more of this nuance expecting to do different things, um, different work. That uh, particularly the, this emotional dirty work, again, it's, it's global self workforces that tend to do this much more um, than, than people coming from the global north. And so for me, I think we need to make space um, for how we can carve out, um, you know, um, uh, broader ethical dis uh, discussions around these more nuanced and tangible, intangible um, labor that's being done. And uh, you know, it, it raises two particular questions for me: is how do we advocate for work that doesn't completely monetize human beings, so it doesn't completely treat them as commodities? And where can we promote regeneration and social reproduction for us as human beings that's outside kind of these market relations or outside 
um, um, market worth, if that makes sense. So I think I'll just leave it at that and just open up for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Melda. If I might, uh, by way of opening the floor, uh, uh, place a question before you just to get things started. Um, concentrating more on the military labor rather than the non-military labor. Because to me, that area is probably um, new, more new than uh, the other kind of non-military or um, no unarmed security. In that sense, the point you made that uh, military labor gets devalued when it becomes privatized because the regular military, there are certain protocols in place historically that when the very, uh, let's say, not the soldiers but the security providers from the global south, uh, they get fewer, my understanding, my understanding is you mean that they are exploited more. Right? Can you mm -hmm. just delve into that a bit? It might be useful for us. And then I'll open it up for the rest of our questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, when the, yeah, when security or military labor becomes privatized, that, um, and it opens up more to a global market. So yes, you see more of a movement to flexible work model um, that, that um, as companies try and turn more of a profit for their shareholders, they you know find new and novel ways to make labor cheap. And so we make labor cheap by naturalizing it, um, going to these natural um, uh, martial race um, contractors, um, but also the the idea of the racializing coming from the global south, where you know they're they're more amenable to uh, work conditions that um, the um, global north contractors. Uh, we never sign on to, and a part of this is unequal economic geographies. Um, you know the, um, the the ideas of no other option or very little limited options for global south workforces that um, mobilize them into the industry where they get paid considerably less. Their contracts are often you know one year to two years before they are able to go home to their families in comparison to. Um, global North contractors who often work for two to three months before they go home to their families, for example. Um, also, it, it uh, plays out in everyday movements where um, uh, Global North contractors can move about the city um, of Kabul, for example, uh, in, in a more autonomous and independent way where Gurkhas and other Global South contractors have more restricted movements, uh, more restricted um, uh, a living or social spaces as as well. Um, white Western contractors can kind of just flow where, where, wherever. Um, so, yeah, so that leads to um, different types of exploitation as well. But there's also Gurkhas that invest in that, um, you know, where a lot of them would recognize the international experience and the um, uh, ability to speak English um, well and the business acumen that these white Western contractors have as justifying for why you know they get paid more have have better contracts where they didn't um, buy into this though was why you know do they have very specific eating times and white Westerners don't and why do they have to wear a uniform and white Westerners don't so more of those um, nuances that they didn't completely buy into. Um, and it was a battle of masculinities at points, which I found really interesting, where white Westerners um, who worked with Gurkhas, a lot of them felt that they were the economic protectors of these men, right? That they were providing them work in the industry where, you know, um, after they left the military, they felt that, you know, the, these guys were just floundering and they had really good skill and we believed in them, so we're going to bring them into the market and we're going to economically protect them and make sure that they've got a living wage and whatnot. Um, whereas Gurkhas would see, you know, their masculinity through physical protection of Western contractors, right? So they say, you know, these Western contractors really don't know the cultural context of Afghanistan. Um, you know, they're, they're super smart, but they just don't, you know, have the, the local intel that we do. So we keep them safe. So we go out on the front line to keep them safe and, you know, and, and they're in their fortified office spaces. So it's interesting how, you know, that 
um, how that obviously, battle of masculinities, who's protecting who, kind of plays out in, in these scenarios. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Um, Surya, I um, just um, um, I got I some random questions. Um, you said carcass. Um, were they were they entire carcass? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, how many of them were retired British carcass? And uh, I'm assuming the majority of the British mass was Indian carcass. I'm assuming. So when I did my initial research in Afghanistan in 2008, a lot of them were um, mostly Singaporean police retired Gurkhas. Right. Now, a majority of them would be Indian Gurkhas. Uh, it's because uh, British retired Gurkhas now look to uh, you know, leave in the UK. Um, so I'm assuming in the sort of managerial post, you would get uh, ex retired Gurkhas as a British Gurkhas? In, in the management position? Yes. Um, they were, when I was doing my field work, they were often um, white Western um, British nationals or American nationals who uh, were former uh, British Gurkha officers themselves or they were, um, you know, just, um, being, yeah, just Westerners. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I mean, you, you touched on the ex British mm -hmm. Um uh, I'm assuming. The, the security companies were, were registered in the UK. Uh, most of them were registered in the UK, but operating in the Arctic. So my question to you is, and in terms of governance uh, and, and transparency, um, surely a government of uh, uh, institutions such as national office would have done their audit. Um, so, uh, and it's really National Audit Office would have done an audit on their activities. How <coughs> did they not pick it up? If there was your know, misappropriation of funds and, uh, and, and that sort of stuff. So, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And you have um, the scholar um, Alka Kralman in particular deals with this with with the US contracts, so the Department of Defense contracts. When um, security companies like um, um, and logistics companies like KBR for example or Halliburton were um, the companies like that were found to be um, fr fraudulent, right? Fraudulent activities and it, it was clear that that was the case, they still got their contracts renewed. And a part of this is it's easier with the incumbent, right? They're already in country. Um, the ways in which the contracts work, it, it, it would cost too much or it's too much of um, a logistical nightmare for a DOD to renegotiate a different contract. So um, this is where you know the, the, the idea of leave it to the market is, is a problematic idea too. Um, so, so yeah. Even when there's accountability measures in place, or in place, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be fraudulent activities, potentially <coughs> other sorts of violations. And um, Amanda, one last thing: Did you do research uh, in the UK as well on on the tiger? So, it was just based in Afghanistan, Iraq, yeah. and whatever else. Um, but my, yeah, well, mo so most of the retired British Gurkhas that are living in the UK that I spoke to are not interested in working in Afghanistan because they can make more working in London than they can work in Afghanistan. Um, the, the men and the families that I talked to from the UK that work in the security industry are the um, British SAS who left um, you know, the SAS and, and now have pursued work in the, in the security industry and their families. And I think it's really interesting to bring into comparison Nepal's elite military forces and British elite military forces and families and how, um, how they come into the industry and experience the industry in very different ways and what this tells us about broader global um, economy of um, unequal geographies, race, gender. I think you could just shut it out now. Yeah, I think I should. Well, thank you very much. Uh,
she would have, uh, this is somebody who uh, wrote a dissertation on the culture history of the Gurkhas at Stanford in 1991. She would have said many things about uh, uh, the emotional labor, assemblages. She would have said, done it, but without using those words. So she knew, really wrote her dissertation before anthropology discovered assemblages and affect. But cover, in the entire territory that you have covered in terms of the emotional labor of uh, Gurkha wives, etc., etc., in a dissertation. So I recommend, if you haven't read that dissertation, please do so. Now, uh, going back to some points that were specific, and I, I think this is important. Uh, one of the points I make is quite important to, to your story. Others are kind of side shows. Regarding the privatization, if you are a historian thinking about the long delay, I don't think the privatization story would look very anomalous. It, it would look like, you know, if you are a dirt shop, and say 1400 to 1800, there were private sometimes recruiting people all over North India, and then states became, modern states then came ultimate uh, legitimacy for themselves to be the ones uh, dictating violence. Now maybe we're shifting uh, from the fact that that's no longer the case. For countries like Nepal, it was never the case that the state had the ultimate and the only uh, authority for violence, right? So, theoretically, this is an interesting question to think about. I will put that separately. The part that was absolutely missing, and I, I thought that was really surprising to me, is that the whole Gurkha involvement in the private security business started, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, from the late 80s, early 90s, from companies that were started by former British Gurkha officers out of Hong Kong and other places where former Gurkha Nepali soldiers were recruited by former officers with whom they are served. That was the network through which those connections became important, right? That's how our Gurkhas ended up, you know, providing private security in the diamond mines in Africa, in, uh, in uh, luxury cruises, and, and, and so forth. And that, that, that connection is absolutely crucial to understand uh, uh, the, the Gurkha connection to private uh, security. No, it's not as if that suddenly uh, this large mega corporation discovered that the Gurkhas in a part to be recruited into private security companies one day. It is this connection, right? And the, and the second phase of this is very important is what Surya was hinting earlier, which is after 97, there were two, two dynamics became very important. One is the depletion of the numbers that were uh, retiring every year, and the fact that most who retired after 97 chose to live in the UK and were not seeking a, a second career in, the, in these jobs. That's how these jobs became uh, open to the Indian Gurkhas and Singapore police and so forth. So in other words, it, the, the, the private security job openings became open to people who had not served a first career in the Gurkhas. Now, if, if you put those two things together, then, then it becomes important, right? To some of the things you were saying earlier, which is about mimicry. Uh, I thought we had put, put that story to rest in the early 90s. Uh, but but you seem to you seem to kind of believe in that that's what they are doing if they are saying that okay you know uh, we're trying to mimic white soldiers I don't think that story was put to rest by for me by Mary Lacy and Ryan Kaplan in the early 90s uh, these these are very smart people knowing exactly what they are contracted into when they get into this service pretending to do some of this but actually laboring for the for the um, for the for the wages and so forth for reasons back home, right? So, so I I found this mimicry part quite unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Of course, British Gurkhas served in Angola and you know throughout and and in, even in Bosnia with Dine Corps as well. They were serving in the 1980s and 1990s. And I have written about that, so I, you know, I apologize if I didn't present that. I think what's important here is this enduring legacy of Gurkhas, right? And the ways in which Gurkhas travel globally. So yes, former British Gurkha officers were the initial champions of these men and bringing them to the global stage. But I mean, the Gurkhas throughout their military service with the British also served with, with US officers too. So the US officers were familiar with who these men were before you know, they were championed in market spaces. Um, Sierra Tamang, of course I've read her work, it's great work. Um, and also Bron Ware, another anthropologist who's written about uh, Gurkhas, I think it's really important. I think 
you know, you raise some really historical issues about Gurkhas and security, but what's, what's fascinating is that these ideas still endure, right? This isn't just a relic of history. These are continually reproduce, re reproduce themselves in, in contemporary security practices. So the idea of mimicry, what I meant by that is it's not necessarily a, a cognitive expression by Gurkhas themselves that they're just going to mimic Western contractors. Rather, it's the ways in which the industry, by large, values security. Again, security, the archetype, the, um, the, the basis for what we think you know, a good security is, is security that's provided by Western um, white men with former military or special policing. And then, how we value other men and women who come to the industry is how they compare to that sort of labor, right? So this is not necessarily a mimicry that Gurkhas are doing, it's rather um, their identities are, are being valued in, uh, you know, by, um, by how much we pay them, by how much we value them um, in, in their different contracts, in how they compare to white Westerners. That's what I meant by the, the concept of mimicry. And it, again, affect, emotional labor, yes, you know, feminists, again, from the 1970s and 80s have been writing about this. And I think, again, I'm coming from a security um, a background, a, a critical security background, as well as a political economy background. And what I find fascinating is how these concepts that were so important in the 1970s and 80s get dropped. And what I want to do is bring them back into the discussion because they still are important discussions in how they manifest in contemporary security practices, not just practices, say, of the 1970s or 80s, for example. But thank you for your comments. Thank you, Dr. Okay, right behind you. Yeah, uh, this is Mr. Lama. Uh, um, in my, my, say, I could start by talking in front of a, a king's discover. I mean, uh, I want to give some compliment to the Amanda's questions uh, in relation to the debugger's queries. Uh, she has elaborated extent extensively uh, from the perspective of feminism, but uh, the, from the lens of international law, the private sector has been remained untouched. So, like say, mercenaries is a high risk crime against humanity from the UN conventions, nobody can work as a mercenaries, but there is always but. It says, if some mercenaries, the private security is employed by the government, by the state, then it remains legal. For example, British workers and French leasers is not mercenaries. Nobody can challenge what they have done in the battlefield, it is the state responsibility. The main problem realizes, say, group four. In Israel, group four is responsible for all the negative things, interrogation and torture, everything is done by the group four, and they are not touchable by the law. Since the uh, Connect Money is a well renowned money activist, so I think this is uh, related for him also. Similarly, if Nepalese government hired group four, for, I mean, interrogation and such, I mean, uh, so uh, another kind of things, it will be a problem. Now, joining the British school cars is not a problem. It is legally, anybody can join the British school cars, but they cannot do any wrong things which is prohibited by the international law. But when the British school cars, they leave, they, they get retirement, and join probably a sign line or black water and all the responsible and whatever they have done, it is individual responsibility. The state cannot take any responsibility. It doesn't mean that private security always bad. What the sign line has done in Sierra Leone, it is remarkable. Without the sign line effort, Sierra Leone will never have peace. So we should not argue about the uh, joining the uh, British workers because if they are earning some money. Going to British school guys is more honorable, and uh, they are earning handsome amount of money rather than going to the other, Al Kuwait. So thank you. 
I think that was a very fine comment and very detailed. And I take it as a comment, um, unless you'd like to respond. Okay. Uta Pora, Puna. I work at Susan as well. Uh, because of its stated theoretical uh, underpinnings of your talk, did you just try to normalize and sanitize uh, non contractual work by calling it emotional support, such as serving teas and others? Thank you. You're going to talk about all that, I think what, what I was trying to do again is uh, the, the basis for that was just exploring exactly what do security contractors do for security work and how um, different uh, men will do different things and the ways in which they get valued by um, clients in everyday encounters for doing different things. So what I found interesting is not normalizing uh, the value of Gurkhas because they bring cups of tea, I think that, that that's absurd, actually. But what I found fascinating, again, is talking to clients who, you know, who had been protected by Gurkhas, who might have not known about Gurkhas before they, say, arrived in Afghanistan. Um, when they reflect upon it, they said, you know, I, I really like that they brought me a cup of tea, or I really like that they always had a smile on their face. Um, and you know, some of them were really concerned about uh, the quality of protection because they didn't they didn't know who these men were, right? And then they were assured by their protection when they, um, you know, that in one case there was a security incident uh, outside of the UN compound and the ways in which these Gurkha men jumped immediately into action. And it was through that encounter that then they became valued as security contractors. And so what I wanted to highlight there is that. Western uh, men do not get the same sort of interrogation um, that these Gurkhas did. They do not get the same sort of uh, value judgment. They just get assumed that they can provide security work, whereas Gurkhas had to, either they got valued for this emotional work or they had to prove themselves before they were valued. That's what I was trying to do. Uh, we have two, uh, two oh, we actually, uh, I thought we have, we have time for two questions, but there are four hands up. So one here, Eta Paila, Mike Eta then the lady over there, then the gentleman here, and last one there. Um, thank you very much for talking about Guru Kaza. Myself, so 19 years in the Guru Kaza, and I did my PhD while I was in the army. Uh, and my postdoc uh, is about the Guru Kaza, it's called Pien Pensu. And currently I'm with the uh, Nepal Open University. So it's very interesting. Thank you very much, sir. And you created here uh, the discourse for the past. That's a great thing. <coughs> um, I would like to uh, outcome my questions. <coughs> I don't have that um, I mean, question, but I would like to answer a few things, uh, the gentlemen, those uh, they have raised here, about Gorka, what people on the government. Uh, about the Communist Sirkar and the people they were, were young leaders, they used to uh, say that. Uh, and, and, but in reality, uh, to close down the uh, British Gurkhas, uh, particularly uh, British Gurkhas is not difficult to state any problem because there are only a few thousands, they can do anything. But there is a problem with the Gurkhas in the South, our neighbor, uh, that is very complicated and number is very large. And they can't do that because there is psychological warfare because of that also they can't do it because there is a uh, uh, Indian government has a conflict uh, uh, with uh, Pakistan and ongoing and, and China as well and uh, and the other thing is Nepal government is not able to absorb them back to Nepal uh, I think it's about more than 50,000 workers are in, um, in Indian worker so that is the problem so even though the government wish to close down Gurkhas uh, because they are linked because of the tripartite agreement. So I don't think so. that is immediately that is uh, possible. Um, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, Amanda, I think you missed one thing. Nowadays there are Gurkhas, those who have, who have taken British citizen, and they are now um, carrying out, taking over the management and everything as British. 
So you can find their um, British citizen Gurkhas, ex Gurkhas, and uh, Gurkhas, those uh, British Gurkhas, those are not. Um, they haven't taken uh, a British citizen, and also Indian um, Singapore Gurkhas are there. But I'm saying that I'm, I'm, uh, if you say that uh, uh, political economy regarding the Gurkhas and things, I'm quite wondering because there's no this kind of uh, um, like a tall horse going in between Gurkhas and uh, British government. Like uh, 1947. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> Make sure. In 1947, when the Nepal government, uh, when uh, tra British, Nepal and Indian government, when they signed the Trump Agreement, there was an agreement that British, uh, Nepal government raised that to wipe out this stigma of mercenary soldiers, pay pens and welfare, everything to people. Okay. But that is still not implement implemented by the British government, uh, and you're supposed to come close with that one. Uh, and still there's a fight between uh, equal and legal. And, and British government is still sticking with the uh, notion of rational of um, fair and legal. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is also good information provided. Perspective also in terms of earlier questions. Now let's rush to lady on the back. Uh, hi, Amanda. Uh, my name is Sangeeta Kabilita. I work as a researcher. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Uh, one is this. Um, the label of being a Gorkha and what it means, you know, about bravery, being honest, being loyal. I mean, to what extent do workers, um, like the performance they give in terms of the emotional labor they perform, in terms of the way they act, to what extent is it guided by the label of living up to this idea of Gorkhas? Or are they just doing it because, you know, any workers who know that they can be easily dispensable and they might not have any other economic opportunities will have to please their employers. So is it just down to that or is it how do they negotiate with this ascribed label of being a Gorkha or, you know, uh, the descendants of Gorkhas? Uh, and the other question is, you said you conduct uh, political uh, ethnography and, uh, you know, I was thinking particularly in security spaces of very male-dominated spaces, and that also in places like Afghanistan, Qatar, UK. Uh, being a female researcher, I mean, access and also your own experiences of it in terms of, is it possible to do ethnography and to what depth? Yeah. So to keep my responses brief, um, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you and talk about the methods. I've written about the methods. Um, complicated. I come from a military background. I used to uh, serve in the Canadian military and I think that helped me get a bit of an in, but it was also um, uh, playing kind of the, the student where they were educating me, which was also you know, a way to get in to explain. Um, but we can talk about that more about methods. Uh, in, in terms of um, you know, how Gurkhas internalized Gurkha to make them you know, a, a loyal Serbian, da da da. Um, I think that's a really difficult question. I think in interviews when Gurkhas would recall their, you know, I'm a Gurkha, this is, you know, uh, intergenerational legacy, is actually in moments of profound violence or insecurity. So um, one in particular, um, the, uh, in an interview talked about in uh, convoy protection, how they came under fire. Um, and in that moment, he was terrified, he said, but then he said he remembers being called, you know, thinking to himself, I am a Gurkha, I can't show fear. And it, it enabled him, he, in that moment, to be resilient, to stand his ground. Uh, so that's when they're really, I think, those are the moments where they call upon this Gurkha heritage. In terms of bringing cups of tea, I don't think they assume that to being um, a Gurkha, but I think a part of this at least if I recall, you know, my own encounters with, with um, some of the Gurkha men bringing me cups of tea, um, I didn't ask for it by the way, they just brought it to me, is, is more of that, um, I felt, a protective role. Um, that's how I read it, that they were taking care of me. I think some of them thought I was a daughter, they, um, you know, because they related to me. They're like, oh, my daughter is in, you know, Australia being educated, and she's doing a PhD like you, and so I think that it was more of a, a paternal, kind of um, a way of them expressing, um, you know, 
protection of me through giving me cups of tea, for example. Yeah. Okay, we have two questions. Two quick questions and two quick answers. Thank you. Hi, this is Avash. I'm a PhD student. I work on uh, Gurkha, especially those who aspire to become professor. I'm looking more at the training preparation part of it. Uh, and one thing that I found fascinating, I've been following your work, is how you use feminist theories to talk about such a masculine domain. And sort of, it kind of, I keep questioning how, you know, what happens then in, in a very, in a, in a national discourse of bravery and masculinity, how does this sort of fit in, right? That's something I, I've, I've uh, tried to reflect upon. But trying to relate to what I do in terms of my work and what you try to do it. Uh, in, in one of the things that I've come across, uh, especially uh, with these young men who uh, you know, aspire to become workers and join these training institutions, and, and I was doing field work in Kokra, uh, is that this legacy uh, that we talk about is sort of extends beyond the workers in terms of just the three military forces. Because now it's been extended into, say, the French Legion, and there are now um, some of the training institutions that provide um, you know, services to get to. Uh, to work as bodyguards, uh, training to go to Europe and sort of then you know take a different you know quads uh, all together and these are young men and they, these are you know 19, 20. Mm -hmm. So there's there's something about how the legacy of work has been utilized even at that stage to sort of extend to all kinds of uh, military military sector. And the other thing about gender that uh, I have also sort of questioned because in this domain that I work with in these training centers, it's very masculine and you don't see any women. So one of the things that I went on exploring and kind of came across was, uh, especially in Pokhara, and I, I work closely with Gurus, is a lot of Gurum young girls are now taking up nursing uh, classes, right? And somehow this, this sort of gender uh, dimension in terms of, you know, trying to fit in, because now it's much more easier for, say, uh, both has to get married and take the spouse to UK to get into the care yes. sector because of their nursing degrees, right? Yes. And that sort of then asks the question, what does the everyday, where does the everyday in that kind of relation sort of uh, you know, exist? So that's something I was reflecting upon. And finally, as we have, uh, in terms of your presentation, uh, I, what I like about and the aesthetic thing of it, I don't know if it was a conscious choice or not, in the way you use the colors, the, the grain of the whole pictures, and sort of the sort of the backgrounding of the images was something that I really found fascinating. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. A very in-depth discussion. So thank you. Uh, last point. How about point level? Okay. Okay. This is my first one. saying that the Gurkhas are working there are more uh, have an emotional part while the Western army is working there have uh, some military intelligence. So while talking about the global security perspective, what do you think the emotional intelligence is more valued or the military intelligence? Thank you. with doing what labor, right? And how this is embodied. So, um, you know, the just the expectation that we don't require Western men to have the same sort of emotional intelligence that we require of women, but also of Global South workers too, right? So it's tracking why certain labor gets normalized into certain bodies and not others, and, and thinking about that as a political question, right? So that's where I'm coming. Thank you. Picking up from the Afghanistan point, and I just have three quick closing remarks by me. It is late, we did go on for a while now, so thank you all of you for staying through this very interesting session, which will, I think, allow us to move further into this discussion of uh, private security contractors uh, and how their parties are working in this arena. But the, one, the point on Afghanistan and linking it to emotional labor what you mentioned, I myself have wanted to delve into this matter of how we were always heard that the Nepalis working with the contractors in Afghanistan are the front line for the blasts. So there is hardly little emotional support there. 
that they are providing, they are actually taking the brunt of it. And so uh, they are essentially cannon fodder put up front, right? And I want to just make that point, not a question, but just uh, counterpoint to the emotional labor point mentioned by Amanda. Uh, I think the emotional labor and the emotional um, burden, the point made by you on, um, on Indian workers, I think we probably now start, should start looking, perhaps maybe others have, but this who's left now would be able to tell us if anybody has done this work, but the emotional burden on Nepali Gorkhas as the idea of Nepali nationalism rises. Before there was talk of too much Nepali nationalism, we just were fighting for under the Gorkhas. But now we know of at least one friend who's become a friend lately who's actually resigned and had to go through a court martial procedure and two years under solitary before he could leave and then come back to Nepal as a citizen. Right? So the emotional burden of Nepali Gurkhas serving in the Indian army knowing that you are fighting a third Sark country under the flag, under Indian flag. I think perhaps we have done injustice to that whole category historically for not looking into this, especially in the more recent times. Um, I was myself also puzzled by the introduction of feminist theory and feminist studies in this. Then I got to realize that uh, you are trying to correlate the experience of the Gorkhas and the racialization and the feminization issues. So thank you for opening up a door for discussion in that whole terrain. Uh, international law, you made the point earlier that uh, exact quote is, international law has not quite got its head around this whole new phenomenon of public security contractors. And I believe that, uh, and I don't know whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, in the sense that, um, and this is my last remark based on all our discussions here, thanking everybody. In the end, at the last point of departure for us intellectually on this topic, what we, what the Nepali state has not been able to provide the Nepali people is gainful employment. And that is why I believe people who are far from power do shout for closure of Gorkha employment, but the closer they go to power, get to power, and the point they get to the pinnacle of power, they shut up. But the, we must understand that the rationale behind that is, when you are out of power, you can say anything. But when you are in power, then you got to look at first both the populist perceptions and po the power of populist opinion. Also, you are not able to give jobs to your people. So, and if security, particularly militarized security, provides higher level of income despite the risks. Then what I would say in conclusion from my perspective would be that uh, at the very least the departure from organized Gorkha labor, if you will, uh, Nepalese in foreign militaries, this seems to have opened up the terrain for gainful employment many fold. Amanda did not give us the data about how many people she would have thought might be working out there. But there has been a manifold increase in Nepalis who their own economy and their own country cannot them provide them with support. This is an opening. So we must worry about the fact that uh, they, they might be out there as cannon fodder, as they are not being protected. They probably don't have any collective bargaining rights under these circumstances. These are the discussions that we should have. Uh, and then we move towards how to generate employment within our country so that these debates will, be, will end once, once and for all. Any last comments, Amanda? And otherwise, we will close up. Just quickly to your last point, um, no security contractor has collective bargaining rights. That's the whole point of privatizing this workforce, right? Yes. So there's precarity across the board. It's just a continuum of precarity, right? So thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of everybody here in this audience, as per tradition, I gift Amanda this, what I believe is a coffee cup, yes it is, <laughs> uh, so she may mull over the discussions and the points raised by all of you here today. And any of, anybody who wants to join her for a discussion outside, you're welcome. Thank you.